You may be seated. A reading from the epistles is from 1 Peter 3, verses 13 through 22. Let us listen for what the Spirit is saying to the church. Now who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated, but in your hearts sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an account of the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good if suffering should be God's will than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteousness for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, <clears throat> but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is eight people, were saved through the water. The baptism which was this prefigured now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from your body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. May God open our hearts and our minds to this word this morning. So catchy expressions often emerge and make their way through churches. One such favorite expression, which I think has been done to death, is blessed to be a blessing. I mean, it's a great expression, but when you've heard it uh, like 90 million times, it kind of loses its impact. However true it is, hearing it over and over and over and over again gets old. The writer of 1 Peter encourages his readers to be zealous for the gospel. I, if we suffer for the right we, reasons, we'll be blessed. That's what he says. I imagine those first century Christians who were thrown out of the synagogues, arrested, tortured, fed to the lions, didn't feel very blessed at times how difficult it must be to hold on to faith in the midst of persecution. Most of us have never experienced that. Most of us have it so easy when it comes to owning our faith. The worst persecution I experienced was from people who told me I couldn't be a minister because I was a woman. Um, it hardly rates up there with being thrown to the lions or hung on a cross or beheaded. But early Christians desperately needed the reminder that even though life is difficult, even though they may not know if they will be alive tomorrow, even though people are not believing the message of Christ that they're proclaiming, they are blessed. Well, most of us grew up hearing the stories of Jesus in the first and second centuries of the Christian era, when Christians talked about Jesus, they encountered a lot of skeptics. First Peter appeals to Christians struggling to be faithful in a world that was very doubtful and skeptical about, and often hostile toward the followers of Christ. And we live in a world today where people are skeptical about Christ, about Jesus. In the highly educated world in which we live here in the DC metro area, skeptics abound. 
In addition, we are ethnically, racially, and religiously diverse. To many, what we say about God becoming incarnate in Jesus, dying on the cross, rising from death, seems like an archaic legend. While we do encounter, uh, do not encounter a level of hostility that the first and second century Christians encountered, nonetheless, we are challenged by some and ridiculed by other people, maybe not to our faces, but behind our backs, and others just ignore us. Despite these challenges, the letter of 1 Peter encourages us to stand strong in our faith. The writer of Peter urged followers of Jesus to be fearless, not intimidated by the questions and challenges of those who do not believe the witness to Christ. He writes, always be prepared. Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Peter's directive assumes that we as Christians, one, have hope, and two, that Jesus is the reason for our hope. How challenging it is at times to feel hopeful in the wake of stuff that happens to us. This week we have another challenge in Parkland, Florida, another horrific school shooting, which prompts grief and despair and raises the perennial why questions. Why did Nicholas Cruz show up at a school that he'd formerly attended and shoot down 17 teachers and youth. Everyone wants to know why he did this. And over time, the backstory emerges. He was suspended. He was fascinated by guns. He had an unstable family life. He was a deeply troubled young man. Nicholas Cruz must have felt hopeless and perhaps considered himself a hopeless cause. It is likely he was a sociopath. We don't know how much that much about Nicholas Cruz yet, but we do know that there are some people who never seem to develop much of a conscience. Dr. Martha Stout, a consulting psychologist at, the, at Harvard University Medical School, wrote a book called The Sociopath Next Door. Kind of a frightening title. She and other researchers suggest that about 4% of the population is sociopathic. Most of the time we are oblivious to them because as Dr. Stout says, they are nearly always invisible to us. Our hearts go out to the families of the victims and my heart breaks for Nicholas, a poor, angry, hopeless feeling young man. In a perfect world, there would be no Nicholas Cruz's, no sad, lonely, troubled, and ultimately de deranged young adults able to secure weapons and ammunition to kill pe so many people in such a short period of time. But we don't live in a perfect world. We live in what biblical writers referred to as a fallen world. The writer of 1 Peter appeals for clear conscience that makes certain charges brought against Christians are for our goodness and not for our participation in evil. Just prior to our reading today, Psalm 34 is quoted, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Peter states that it is better to suffer for doing right, for doing God's will, than to suffer for doing wrong. Truth is, we're all going to suffer. It's just part of the human condition. So every one of us is going to experience some kind of suffering in our lives. If you've not suffered yet in your life, I guarantee you, you will. 
We cannot escape it. We catch the flu. We lose a job. A child dies. We get sick. We die. Our faith teaches us that death is not the end. That we will live eternally with God in an existence beyond the confines of this world and its troubles. In the meantime, we are given instructions on how to live faithfully, how to live with hope. First, the writer tells us we are blessed. Even when we are suffering, we are blessed. You need to feel the blessing. And that's why they talk about counting our blessings. Counting our blessings helps us to realize how very blessed we are. If we just think about the negative, then we're going to dwell in the negative. If we think about the positive, we'll dwell in the positive. That's not to say that we don't look at the negative from time to time, because that can be informative. No one but a masochist enjoys suffering. And most of us don't feel all that blessed when we are sick or angry or sad. The writer encourages faithful suffering. Suffering with faith differs from suffering without hope. The writer of First Peter reminds us not to fear, for it is those without faith who are fearful. But keeping Christ in our hearts, foremost in our lives, we will not be intimidated. The writer assumes that there will be suffering. In our time, we work hard to alleviate discomfort, at least our own suffering and the discomfort of those we love. People might initially take op opioids, for instance, to feel less pain, but then they get, become addicted. The writer of our scripture today assumes that there will be suffering. He knows that Christians run the risk of being maligned for our faith, so he appeals for, to us to maintain a clear conscience by engaging in good conduct, conduct that reflects our relationship to Christ. The fact is that all of us will suffer, and it breaks our hearts to know that there are some people who suffer all the time. The writer makes the point that it is better to suffer for doing good than suffer for being evil or engaging in evil activities. Much great literature has engaged the subject of suffering and struggle. Indeed, a story without challenge, without even a hint of suffering, would be less engaging, wouldn't it? There always has to be some challenge. We all root for the protagonist who overcomes the challenge and endures heartbreak or accident or grueling physical uh, exertion in order to succeed. At times, I visited people who were so overwhelmed with suffering, they could find no hope. Life seemed unlivable to them. And at times like these, I let the person know that we, in the church, hold on to hope for him or for her. We'll hope for each other when we're down and out. I remind the person that Jesus knows our suffering. In the early church, Christians encountered intolerance and persecution for their faith. In the presence of discrimination, our first response might be to lash out in defense. But the writer of 1 Peter teaches that Christians are to be agreeable, sympathetic, loving, compassionate, and humble. We are blessed, and our mission is to be a blessing to others. So Lent is a time for us to reflect on how we're doing with both receiving and giving blessing. First Peter reads, And baptism now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The writer suggests that a clear conscience is a good conscience, a conscience that comes from blessing 
others. So when we sign up to make meals for the women's shelter, when we visit the sick, when we take communion to a homebound member, when we listen compassionately to the grief and despair of another, we can sleep better at night. Eugene Peterson's translation ren renders bless. That's your job, to bless. Our job as Christians is to bless and to be a blessing to others. Though our motivation is to be a blessing to others, we will be blessed in our blessing. It works. By blessing, we are blessed. So in the craziness of our daily lives, we often forget this purpose, our purpose. Good consciences are what we need, and we need them in abundance in our world. So let us model the integrity people desperately need by sharing genuine love and pointing the way to faith and hope. Let us be a blessing to those we encounter. Amen.